Uh, I am the Catherine Coker. Uh, Melvin Jenkins Joe, the law librarian, is a little bit under the weather this morning, so I am hosting or co-hosting in her absence. Uh, we really are excited to have Meredith with us today. Uh, I wanted to give a brief introduction. Most of you probably already are familiar or uh, know Meredith better than I do. I'm sort of new to Virginia. Uh, Meredith is a public historian, writer, and speaker. Uh, her areas of expertise include religious history, historical impacts of the present, religious education, Southern culture, and the intersection of religion and popular political culture. Her most recent book, her first book, is Richmond Theater Fire, and I was looking at some of the reviews that there are very positive. I just wanted to read one excerpt. It says, the Richmond Theater Fire is totally engrossing, a real page turner. Baker ably depicts the vibrancy of social and cultural life in early Richmond and captures the horror, chaos, and shock of this terrible deflagration. She does a marvelous job of unearthing and marshalling primary sources to recreate for us a most detailed and heartbreaking account of this disaster that I have ever read. And all the other reviews are just as positive as that one, Meredith. Also, Meredith is a teacher, and she developed and edited the curriculum materials that are used by 30,000 teachers nationally. Very, that's very outstanding, Meredith. So we are glad to have you here. And without further ado, we'll give it over, hand it over to Meredith. Well, hi everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. I'm gonna try to share my screen here. And let's see, can everyone see it? Yes. yes. Okay, super. So uh, thank you so much, Catherine, for having me here today. Um, I'm going to be presenting my research for uh, an upcoming project that I'm calling right now Scenic Sisters, How Garden Clubs Cultivated Virginia's Female Political Activists. And um, maybe gardening brought you here today. Um, maybe you've met me before and you're here to support me, thank you. Um, or maybe you're really interested in women's political activity in Virginia or just in general, but I hope this presentation will answer some of your questions. I hope it'll be interesting to you. It'll give you some ideas, inspire some reading, and um, maybe draw some observations uh, out that can make my final project better. Um, so as Catherine noted, I'm a history teacher. Um, I wrote a book, it came out almost 10 years ago, came out in 20, <laughs> 2012. And uh, so this is, this is my next big project. Uh, I've been awarded a Virginia Humanities Fellowship uh, to research this. And because of COVID, my residency at the Library of Virginia was delayed from last fall, hopefully to this fall. Um, and I'm eager to start work on that, but with flexible, we all have to be flexible with COVID. So um, I'm just sort of staying tuned for, for that. But uh, there are great garden related archives at the Library of Virginia that I'm eager to get into. So um, this is, let me see if I can, there we go. So this is the, the project. Here's my uh, cover of my book. And so um, that's a little bit about me as a historian slash writer and teacher. Um, but how about me as a gardener? Um, my record there is very spotty. I do attempt to keep container gardens. Um, and my children at the beginning of COVID last year did a detailed map of our backyard. And I'm going to zoom in on my garden. Um, they labeled it the <laughs> Garden of Death. And it has lots of little brown <laughs> plants in it. So um, I'm tackling this project uh, with a more limited knowledge of gardening uh, than I have of history. But I'm excited to get started because uh, my own background with gardening clubs has been really positive. Uh, a local gardening club helped my preschoolers learn how to plant paper whites. My mother was uh, part of a master gardener's club, and she would man a phone line for people like me um, and answer questions about horticulture. 
and whatnot. So I really believe in the importance of gardening clubs, the kind of public education that they provide. Um, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to learn a little bit more about them in Virginia. And two centennials happened at the same time last year, which really got me thinking. One of them was a centennial of the Garden Club of Virginia, and the other one was a centennial of the 19th Amendment. And I started to wonder, were these two movements connected in any way? So once women's suffrage happened, and once these garden clubs were started, were there ways that women used these clubs to advocate for themselves or for their communities politically? Um, and as I started to dig in, oh, here's the organizing question. To what extent do women's garden clubs in Virginia serve as centers for political organization and leadership training? And I'm looking at 1920 when they started to about 1965. So um, the first, you know, first 50 years or so. And what I found was that these women's garden clubs from the beginning were interested in more than parties and daffodils. Um, I think a lot of coverage when we think about specifically the Garden Club of Virginia or Virginia Women's Gardening Clubs, what's in the headlines most of the time is historic preservation work, education, beautification, not so much the social activism, yet those were things that from the beginning, uh, first meetings of the clubs were a, mo a major motivation. Um, I'm sure y'all are familiar with the Junior League and the kind of social work that they do on behalf of the community. Uh, there was one critic in the early years of the Garden of the Garden Club of Virginia, and he referred to it as the Senior League of Virginia, where all the old junior leaguers go to die, but don't. Um, <laughs> so I think that does give us a hint of the fact that uh, it wasn't just about gardening; it was also about uh, about social activism. Now. The two major things that I think are missing from the gardening club story, at least in the public imagination, are the ways that they change state environmental policy and highway policies. Their impact is enormous. They were involved as early as 1929, less than a decade after um, being able to vote. They were already involved in legislative committees. Um, and this isn't exactly surprising. Even histories of women often fail to mention their civic involvement prior to the 60s. And I found this quote when I was teaching a class to some of my students. Um, a historian looked at women's magazines pre-1960, pre-women's movement, um, to try to determine to what extent were these women politically active. And what she found was really surprising. Even uh, magazines like uh, Ladies Home Journal that would generally review refrigerators um, as early as 1947, they were encouraging women to, quote, make politics your business, voting, office holding, raising your voice for new and better laws. These are just as important to your home and your family as the evening meal or spring house cleaning. So I think behind the scenes, uh, there's a very active political life that's going on pre-1960 in the lives of Virginia women that uh, really hasn't been on the radar. Another thing that's been left out the presence and the proliferation of Black women's gardening clubs and their civic action. When people think of garden clubs in Virginia, they think Garden Club of Virginia. Um, but there also was a group called the Negro Garden Clubs. And by the 1940s, they actually outnumbered Garden Club of Virginia chapters. Um, they also were very active in subverting uh, segregationist practices and policies, registering members to vote. So there's a whole side of the garden story that I think isn't being told that I would like to dig into so that my story is more complete and it's not uh, a lopsided telling. So for example, um, this is a, a quote from uh, Asa Sims, who was a horticulturist based in um, Hampton Institute. At the time it was Hampton Institute. And he talks about the Garden Clubs of Virginia, um, the NGC Clubs of Virginia, and he talks about them as being focused on community improvement. So again, this is not an organization that's just based on hobbyists and soil quality. They're also looking at how they can change their communities. And I'm gonna get into a few ways that that happened. Um, and so the organizations were the Federated Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia, and the Virginia State Garden Clubs. Um, and again, 
once it's easier to get to records, I cannot wait to get to the Hampton Institute and start digging more into this. Um, because I feel like there are a lot of stories there that, that I'm, that I need to include. So uh, even though it's earlier in the project, what is my research shown so far about garden clubs and women's political activity in Virginia? Well, for starters, the women's garden clubs had political goals from the outset. Um, one of the uh, first meetings, actually the minutes of the first meeting in May 1920 of the Garden Club of Virginia said their purpose was for good roads, to be against the billboard nuisance. They were for the preservation of plants, roadsides, historic homes and gardens, conservation of native uh, beauty and native species, and warfare against pests. So they already have some stated goals that are political from the outset. In 1927, seven years in, um, they report the struggle for the preservation of our native flowers and trees was taken to the legislative halls of the General Assembly of Virginia and the Garden Clubs of Virginia rendered valiant aid in securing uh, the National Blue Ridge Park for Virginia. Wow. So their, their early notes, they talk about having tea parties at the Ellersby Mansion, but then they also will talk about the uh, meetings that they had in the legislative halls. So, uh, Here's another quote from 1927. Um, so they're working on uh, preserving native flowers. They have a conservation committee. They're offering prizes to school children about writing essays for saving the wildflowers. Um, they have this conservation aspect and public education aspect that they're engaged in. Um, but they're also taking it to the next step and they're also meeting with members of Congress to advocate for these um, priorities. Uh, another thing is they have a nemesis. There's a bad guy and a villain in the Garden Club story, and it is the Demon Highway Department, which is now known as VDOT. <laughs> they hated them. And really, the, the, um, the stories are, are um, quite amusing. There's one where they talk about, uh, in 1949, they have complaints about the State Highway Department's extensive planting of Chinese elms. And the words used to describe the State Highway Department's uh, planting efforts are hideous, diseased 13 months out of the year, and not a pretty color in fall or spring. And they wrote uh, with protests to the Highway Department about this. They also went back and forth with the Highway Department because they would often uh, plant trees. So for example, they decided they were going to cultivate dogwoods. And once they'd grown to about three feet in height, uh, garden clubs across Virginia had to figure out what to do with these. And they thought, well, we'll plant them along the roadsides. And uh, they note in their, uh, in their records in 1932, uh, they needn't have worried about money for their upkeep because many of those so carefully placed were subsequently cut down by the Demon Highway Department. And then in 1936 at the Kenmore, um, the Kenmore Club writes that they planted the city entrance with crepe myrtles and dogwoods, quote, which were lost to us and the city when the State Highway Department widened the highway and did not furnish the means of the men or the men to help take care of the planting, period. Everything died, period. So you see a lot of back and forth. The women are planting these trees. The Highway Department is cutting them down. Um, but by the 1930s, you do see them come to a sort of detente and they begin to work together and collaborate. Um, and I'm really interested in knowing kind of what, what was it that turned the tide here? I, I haven't found that out yet, um, but there is a lot of animosity, especially in the 20s and the 30s between the highway department and the garden club who are at odds with one another. Um, other enemies that they list uh, in no uncertain terms in their records include utility companies, and junkyards and also advertisers who they sometimes name names um, and argue about the fact that even though there's incredible support for their beautification initiatives, the money bags from major advertisers are still the ones who are getting uh, their bills passed instead of the women of the garden club. Um, but as I mentioned, they did, uh, they did eventually reach a kind of peace with the highway department and collaborate with them. One of my favorite stories that I found, it may be a little bit apocryphal, um, but it's about Mrs. Daniel Sands. 
And it notes in the records, you can see underneath, this is not my quote, it says her bane was billboards, but she was a very early leader in the um, Garden Club of Virginia. And she drove around in a chauffeured limousine. And in the back of her limousine, she kept an ax. And she hated these billboards. You see the pictures there that I have. They were just sort of all helter skelter. There was no real zoning or rules. Um, the women thought they were hideous and hated them. And if nobody was around and she saw a particularly offensive billboard, she'd have the chauffeur pull the limo over, she'd grab her ax, and she would take care of it herself. So, um, Vigilante actions like this did not endear the women of Virginia's garden clubs to advertisers nor the highway department. Uh, but besides their sort of... Um, <laughs> um, mm, extra legal means of taking care of highway beautification, they did engage in political lobbying and petitions. I want to know particularly what did they do to try to get the attention of legislators? What did they do uh, specifically to organize? Um, the legislators, we have records of them referring to the, to the Garden Club members as nosy meddling women, so they did not always appreciate their efforts. Um, and they did, in fact, sometimes ambush politicians. There's one instance, it's called, uh, they referred to it as Operation Devious. Um, this was later. Governor Holton in the 70s had a plan to uh, renovate the Capitol grounds and basically clear cut everything. So the women invited him to come to speak at a meeting. They made a beautiful map where they labeled every single tree on the Capitol grounds. And then they ambushed him with it and said, we know you would never cut down all these beautiful trees. Here you go, this is a keepsake. We know you wouldn't be the kind of person to do that. And he was sort of cornered um, in front of cameras uh, by the women. And so they were not, they were not above uh, some attention getting stunts. But a lot of their means were just the usual way that, that constituents try to get the attention of their legislators. Um, we know from the records that they organized letter writing campaigns. Um, I do have a, one of the problems that I'm running into is polite Virginia society refers to all women by their husband's names. And so I have to do some untangling, but Mrs. Thomas Wheelwright, as she's called in the records, did write. I do think the more letters you write, probably the more unpopular popular you are, but the more apt you are to get the thing done. Men hate to be nagged. So they organized letter writing campaigns for various issues that were important to them. For example, we all know how much they hated the billboards. Um, one legislator told a leader of the club, we have gotten more letters about this bill than any other measure. So we know that they were very effective in mobilizing their gardening clubs to directly petition their legislators. And also in 1953, a few decades later, the Conservation Committee writes, our job seems to be one continuous protest. So they are actively, um, they're actively petitioning the government uh, as a committee, as the statewide committee um, to make changes. And then they also spell out to their members, here are some ways you can reach out. And they're very organized. So this is a magazine called Garden Gossip, right? Where it has um, information about plantings and blight and things like that. But here's um, an article, Practical Suggestions for Billboard Campaigns. This is going out to all the clubs across the state. One of them says, subscribe to the Roadside Bulletin. Educate yourselves, first of all. Get familiar with, um, with the lay of the land and billboard restrictions. Know the laws. And then they say later on here, um, work with existing departments. So you're collaborating with them, and we're not coming across as being acrimonious. And then they also list specific asks. When you write to them or when you contact them, this is what we want you to ask for. And in addition to trying to um, influence people uh, socially to dislike these ugly billboards, uh, they're also going to, and I quote, secure legislation to finish the job. So what I found in their records is a very uh, structured and organized uh, legislative agenda and action plan for their members in order to achieve legislative change. And uh, one of the success stories, this one I thought was kind of hilarious. Um, 
1936, they organized a letter writing campaign and effectively changed the name of Skyline Drive. Uh, it was going to be called Ike's Driveway. Somebody help me. This is like pre Eisenhower. So I have no idea who Ike is or why they were going to name this road after him. But we can all thank the women of the Garden Club of Virginia that it is Skyline Drive and not <laughs> Ike's Driveway. That's <laughs> off. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit beforehand, but in addition to the letter writing, they also did direct lobbying by the Tuckahoe Club branch. Um, hate the game. Uh, not the player here, um, the women would pair up. This is specifically the Tuckahoe Club branch. They were based in West Hampton, kind of the west part of Richmond. And so they plugged their noses and plunged into politics. And it notes that political activity was new to the ladies of the Tuckahoe Club, but undaunted, they went about it in a very feminine way. Members were sent out in units of two to interview the legislators. They were chosen with the greatest care, one for her good looks, the other for her ability to speak well. The system seemed to work quite successfully. The gentlemen were so entranced with the beauties, they readily agreed to vote for whatever the speakers proposed. <laughs> so, all right. We also have direct lobbying and uh, 1930s style. There you go. Um, the, uh, in, in other research, uh, looking at uh, Black women's gardening clubs, I also found that they had some explicit political goals in their meeting. And they also had some very successful political outcomes. One of the things that they did uh, was they intentionally partnered with white clubs in order to build bridges and to educate white women. Um, they also were interacting as peers in this kind of environment. And that was really challenging these existing caste structures that were just part of everyday life. But through garden clubs, they were able to challenge those and escape those. Um, they have explicit goals of improving race relations. You don't see this goal in the white women's gardening clubs, I will say. But this is something that the black women's gardening clubs listed as a priority. Um, so I'm hoping to dig more into some of these collaborative events and to see if they did any political lobbying. Um, one of the big engines behind um, the uh, black women's gardening clubs was the Hampton Institute, um, now Hampton University. They had a horticulture institute that provided a lot of resources and educational materials to support clubs across the state. Um, and they have long been a school that prioritized um, uh, agricultural and horticultural knowledge and had a lot of experts. Um, one interesting treasure I've been able to find is the 1942 handbook. And uh, a lot of their meetings happened and we don't have notes for them. Uh, conferences don't always have notes. But in 1942, the war has just broken out. They can't have a conference. There's a lot of rationing. Um, travel is more difficult. And so they published a book with a foreword by Eleanor Roosevelt herself. And they send it out to every club in Virginia. And so these women's clubs have a book with all of these different topics are discussed in the book, trees and shrubs, victory gardens, um, controlling diseases, soybeans, houseplants. So every chapter can be kind of like a conference talk that they can discuss amongst themselves in their clubs. But one of the most interesting chapters to me was about 10 years of progress by the Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia. And this is where we see some of their political goals. Um, the theme of one of their conferences, for example, uh, in the Roanoke Tribune in 1953, making Virginia a better place to live through gardening. So again, it's not just a locally focused thing. It's a very outward um, focus for the club and their objectives. And what they note in the handbook is wherever a club has been established, the white women of the community have promptly offered their assistance in all phases of the work, up to getting city and county officials to improve the streets and roads. So women in these NGC clubs are leveraging the connections of women in these white garden clubs, and they're using the connections that they've made there in order to get city improvements um, that had been lagging to get those accomplished for, for their neighborhoods. So, um, I mean, this is sort of unofficial, but they're still using garden clubs as a way to get 
their objectives met for city improvements. And the club leaders add, this is one of the highest forms of interracial cooperation where two races are working on a common project without thinking about race, but a common opportunity to build a more beautiful community for all. Another thing that they did was um, they would have uh, joint gardening um, meetings and clubs. Here's one uh, from Roanoke from the Richmond, it's a dispatch from Roanoke from the Richmond Planet, which was an African-American newspaper. And it specifies that um, they had a garden school and the NGC says a group of our women were invited and several won some of the choice prizes. So again, this is an opportunity for them to make a statement to their white gardening peers about their own um, superior abilities in, in this area that's important to both of them. And also you see horticulture being an unsung weapon against segregation. Um, they're beautifying their neighborhoods. A lot of the, the um, notes that you see talk about the ways that they are upgrading their neighborhoods. These are areas that had been redlined, um, that had been deliberately devalued and undervalued. And the women in the NGC clubs are making these neighborhoods more beautiful and adding value to them by their work. So for example, um, here are some notes about what clubs uh, accomplished in the 1930s. One was responsible for paving a distance of 25 city blocks. They spearheaded an effort to extend bus transportation. And then down at the bottom, you can see they also were able to uh, arrange for mail delivery instead of having them the mail delivered to the end of the street, they had mail delivered to their homes. So they're seeing through civic improvements that on the face of it don't have a lot to do with gardening, but do. So I think it's important to remember that activities that are often dismissed as frivolous or non-essential like gardening and gardening clubs, these historically matter really deeply in terms of creating serious lasting social change. So I think it's perhaps easy to see this as an extra, um, something women do on the side or whatever, but the um, real changes they were able to affect were, um, were lasting and were very important. So, so far, um, I think if I had to summarize what I've learned so far, I, it's pretty clear to me that club work was consistently oriented toward benefiting the wider community. It's also clear that Virginia's gardening women did not just impact the horticultural world or the roadways, but they also ended up shaping the social and political landscape in really important ways. And then finally, um, as I just mentioned, that these sort of, these arts activities, uh, flower arranging, wasn't just flower arranging, it was sabotaging segregation. Um, meeting in a garden club wasn't just a way to exchange tips about bulbs. It was a means of registering black female voters so that they had a voice. We see this directly happening. One of the clubs in their 1942 report says all of our members are voting. So um, I think that there's a real, uh, there's a, a really compelling story here that I'm excited to dig into and I'm excited to tell um, and I'm, I, looking back at the women of these early garden clubs with a lot of admiration at this point for their boldness and for their creativity and for the ways in which they used uh, an activity that they loved to make changes that make my life in Virginia better today. So on that note, um, I'm open for questions if anybody has any questions about research and then if you have um, if you have any information to share or any ideas or something you think would be fun to include, please feel free to reach out. I've got my um, web address here and there's a little contact form. You can send me a note. Um, and I also want to thank the uh, Richmond Public Library and also the League of Women Voters for making this talk possible. I really appreciate uh, both of your organizations so much. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. We, uh, I mean, that was, a, I, that was a fabulous presentation. I, I had no idea. It, I just love your use of primary sources and showing us how you use them 
how uh, important they are to research and the impact of these women on not only horticulture, but on race relations, which I had no, I didn't know about. Uh, we have, do have several questions already in the chat. Uh, and uh, we invite all of you to uh, put your questions in the chat. And I have to put in a word for Meredith. If you could help her in the research, and please do, because it is challenging in this COVID era. So one of the questions is, I, can Meredith, can you see the questions? I am, let me see. I wonder if I can question, see. Well, one question is from Lynn. Uh, she said, I often thought that the League of Women Voters gave women experience with organizations, administration, et cetera, but most were the workforce. It sounds like the Garden Club did the same. Yes. So um, I think some, sometimes it depended on the committee. So when women joined the Garden Club, they could also join local committees and state committees. And so if you were on the conservation committee, as that quote said before, they said, well, our work on the conservation committee is one endless protest. So if you were a member of the conservation committee, uh, you pretty much knew that you were going to be focusing on legislation and addressing lawmakers and things like that. Whereas if you chose a different committee, you, you might not be as politically involved. Whereas, you know, with the League of Women Voters, um, you're going to be, you're going to be working on political issues, no matter what group you're in. So, um, so yeah, I think that the Garden Club did some of that same work as the League of Women Voters, but with more of an environmental focus and uh, with a smaller group of its participants. Melda yep. would like to know if men were involved in this, in the Garden Club. So, yes, actually. Um, and in fact, there are a number of men who are mentioned as being pretty much indispensable to the functioning of the club. And two that immediately come to mind were both African-American men. Um, one of them uh, was, uh, and they looked to him for uh, information and advice on planting. He was their go-to person for trees. And so a lot of, when you read about the tree planting um, sort of blitzes that they took, we're gonna improve the roadways, we're gonna put trees here, we're gonna cultivate dogwoods, his name comes up. And one of my challenges is that often in the Garden Club of Virginia records, um, they'll refer to African-American people by a single name. And so I don't, or, you know, patronizingly as uncle somebody or whatever. And so I, I don't always have their full name. So that's some detective work that I have to do so that I can be sure that these people get the credit that they deserve. And then later on with the Garden Club of Virginia, um, there's a man who works at the headquarters who facilitates all of their social events. And so he is the person in charge of all the parties, all the fundraisers, all of the meetings, you know, if they invite legislative groups in or whatever, he's the person who makes it happen. So, um, so yes, I, I did see several men's names come up in the records. The third group of men that's involved, uh, a number of them leverage their husband's connections. You see things like um, so-and-so's husband is a judge or so-and-so's husband knows so-and-so. And so they did leverage, um, they did leverage their, their husbands <laughs> um, to be able to make connections that they needed for, to, get, to get some things done. Uh, Melvin asked, uh, have you reached out to Virginia chapters of the African-American sororities like Alpha, Kappa, Alpha, and Delta, Sigma, Theta? So I haven't reached out to sororities. Um, I do have, uh, I have reached out to a friend of a friend who works at um, the Black History Museum in Richmond and her family growing up was very, her, I think her mom was in two or three different clubs and she, um, uh, she remembered her mother presenting um, something to Lady Bird Johnson um, at some event. So, so I'm, I'm following up with some people that I've met who, whose families were active in club movements in the hope that uh, they might have some family stories or some family leads 
that will help me find out more about the members. But I think the sorority following up with local sororities is a, is a great idea. And Janet, uh, Woody yes. wants to us was commenting that Lee Park in Petersburg. Okay. This again? Hello? Oh, Aaron. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I heard something. Oh, uh, Meredith, are you there? Yeah, I am. Okay, we. Well, I lost your video for some reason. Oh. Okay. Oh, there you are again. You popped back in. Okay, Janet, what do you uh, made a comment that? Lee Park in Petersburg was a works progress administration project, not related to garden clubs that I know of, but a very interesting story on its own. Just making that comment. Sure, I'll I'll um I'll look that up. I I know that um the Garden Club of Virginia specifically, a lot of the um they were real champions of state parks across Virginia, the development of state parks, the maintenance of state parks. Um, that was also something that sort of fell under their, their wheelhouse that because, I mean, their advocacy for that, um, I haven't dug into as much, but um, I know that that was an important priority for them too, was having these public green spaces um, that were accessible to everybody. I wonder if the Works Progress Administration records would have any, anything on on this, if we could get to them. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, it might be, that might be kind of far-fetched, but they may have something there. That's a good uh, point, Janet. Uh, Karen uh, Rosenboob asked, uh, or make a comment, our league has recently been meeting women of color in the League of Women Voters, which also depicts the efforts of black women to make inroads into the league delivered issues of racial justice and probably in the same era. That might yes. be a lead. I just, I just got my copy of the book. So <laughs> I missed the last um, book club discussion because I, I picked up the book the day before the book club discussion and I was uh, unconvinced that I could fake anything convincingly. Um, because I hadn't yet read the book. So I, but I know that you're still reading through it. And so I'm hoping to join at a later point, but that it, I am looking forward to digging into that because I, that could also be a good resource. Like I said, I'm sure there's overlap between women's club involvement and garden clubs and, and League of Women Voters. I just haven't connected all the dots yet. Okay. Uh, Janine, Janine, no, Janine. Uh, were there specific areas of Virginia that were most active? Um, so in terms of the NGC clubs, uh, Roanoke does a lot of, I'm not sure if Roanoke was the most active, but Roanoke has the best reporting about garden clubs. So garden clubs make the news in Roanoke. And so they have a lot of updates about what's going on in the gardening world from that neck of the woods. Um, also, uh, the Hampton Roads area, Norfolk, um, that area also, you know, the area that's closer to Hampton University, that area had, um, had a lot of very successful, very active gardening clubs. Um, and the ones around Richmond, perhaps because of proximity, I've read more about their direct Activity. But again, you know, they're within driving distance of the of the capital. Um, so yeah, those are the areas that have popped up in my research. Roanoke, um, further east, and um, and then Richmond. There is one. So there's there's one thing that I want to look into though. So there's something that happened in 1938, and um, it's called the Cherry Tree Rebellion, and they were uh, putting in the uh, Jefferson Memorial in the Tidal Basin, but the cherry trees were already there. So to put the memorial in, they had to cut down some cherry trees and all these society women flocked to the Tidal Basin and chained themselves to cherry trees. Wow. And the only um, thing that made them leave was the fact that park rangers plied them with tea until they had to go to the bathroom, at which point, this park ranger told me this, um, at which point they asked to be unchained, you know, or they unchained themselves, whatever, they used the bathroom eventually. Um, the the protest dissipated. And in the dark of night, um, 
the federal workers came back and removed the trees when the women weren't there. But I'm curious, just because it's so close to Northern Virginia, if there weren't a uh, garden club of Virginia women who were involved in this cherry tree rebellion um, in Washington, DC. I don't know, but it's possible. Well, that leads you to the National Park Service records. It does, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess you searched through the Roanoke Times, the newspaper. Excuse me? I guess you're searching through the Roanoke Times, the newspaper. Yes. yes. Now, Melvin said she mentioned the sororities because they keep meticulous records. That's a great point. Yeah. Great point. Now, Karen Rosenblum uh, said, your work does make me wonder about histories of VDOT or highway construction generally, which apart from ignoring women's gardening clubs, also destroy black neighborhoods through highway construction. And let's remember Lady Bird Johnson. Yes, so um, I think you're talking about the connection between VDOT and uh, some of the highway projects that were really destructive. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting. I, I, uh, I haven't, I know a lot of that happened in the, um, the new highway projects happened like Eisenhower and later. So um, that's sort of late in, late in my timeline. Um, but that would be interesting to dig into also to see if, uh, if garden clubs took a position against these major highway projects, especially ones that were, that were cutting through existing neighborhoods. Um, yeah, I don't have any research on that yet, but that, that would be something really interesting to look into. Yeah, that would be interesting to how the highway affected uh, Jackson Ward. Yeah. If, if, they'll, if the garden clubs are, you know, are maybe in uh, protest, maybe. Are yeah. there any other questions for Meredith in the chat? Please put your questions in the chat. It's a very engaging discussion and presentation, Meredith. I'm really excited about it and really excited about your research and hope people will get, reach out to you and hope you have more opportunities to give your presentation so you could get more uh, leads. Uh, as we discussed before, it's just challenging right now in COVID, but on the, on the flip side, these uh, COVID has uh, created these Zoom opportunities. That's true. And you can reach more people, really. So I'm hoping you'll be able to, maybe other libraries will invite you to reach, uh, like, like in the Hampton Roads area. That, that would be, since you said a lot of the activity was at Hampton Roads, so it be, might be good if, you, if they would invite you and maybe mail their night to reach out to them, help you. Well, thank you. Yeah, and thank you again for hosting too, Catherine. I really appreciate the the invitation. And thanks to everyone on the League of Women Voters side who who looped me in on this. Um, I always appreciate it. To, a chance to get to talk about uh, amazing women in Virginia history. That's my jam. I love it. <laughs> yes. We uh, love having you here, Meredith. So I look forward to seeing your product when you publish it. And we look forward maybe to having you again. Thank you so much, Catherine. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day and we'll look forward to your book. All right, bye everybody. Bye. Thank you for coming. Okay, bye.